Congrats on getting beyond a million. What got you here won't always get you there. This is a podcast for entrepreneurs who want to reach beyond their seven-figure business and scale to eight, nine, and even 10 figures. I'm Brad Weimert, and as the founder of Easy Pay Direct, I have had the privilege to work with more than 30,000 businesses, allowing me to see the data behind what some of the most successful companies on the planet are doing differently. Join me each week as I dig in with experts in sales, marketing, operations, technology, and wealth building, and you'll learn some of the specific tools, tactics, and strategies that are working today in those multi-million, eight, nine, and 10-figure businesses. Life can get exciting beyond a million. Today, I'm having a conversation with Julian Reyes. Julian is a killer marketer. He largely built his company through affiliate marketing and direct response marketing. There are tons of really actionable takeaways in this episode. Through the years, Julian built a $50 million company, and we're going to hit on crafting the product and marketing message. We're also going to hit on some operational details of how his role has changed, moving from seven figures to eight figures and multiple eight figures. And we're going to go into some of the details around kind of the vulnerability of aggressive marketing and how to protect yourself as you scale a company through aggressive marketing. I loved geeking out on some of this stuff, both the marketing and the challenges that come with it. I hope that you get a lot out of it. If you do share it, or just, you know, store it inside yourself. But enjoy the episode. Julian Reyes, man, it's great to see you. Thanks for showing up. Great to see you, Brad. Thanks for having me, man. I, I After hanging out with you at War Room, I was like, I can't believe this guy's putting me on his podcast. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you were crossing some boundaries and uh, making people uncomfortable, but I feel yep. like that's sort of par for the course with you. It's what I do. Yep. So it's, before... It's a, good, it's a good test, Brad. It's a good test. Like if somebody can handle my weird quirkiness, then that's like, that. they're cool in my book. And some people can't. I'm a little polarizing at times. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I think that that's definitely a good litmus test for who you want to actually hang out with and spend time with. Mm. Um, does it ever get you into trouble with uh, like potential business relationships? Um, not that. That hasn't got me into trouble. <laughs> Something else has some, yeah, a couple <laughs> other things have, but only a couple of times I've, you know, listen, you can't be in business. I mean, I've been in business for 15 years and dealt with hundreds of people or thousands of people at this point, you're going to bump heads with somebody, you know, eventually yeah. it's just inevitable. Like, like part of the journey is you're going to get some battle scars along the way. And you know, it is what it is. Yeah. That's interesting. I was thinking about this last night because, uh, I'll leave the details out, but I, I ha I've had a couple business relationships in the last like three days that have created a lot of friction for me. And I've had sort of a vocal response to these people. And I thought like, you know, is this on me? You know, anytime something happens consistently in my world, I reflect on it and think, mm -hmm. how was I a part of the negative outcome that I had? And is mm -hmm. this me overreacting and all this stuff? But then as I looked at it, I thought, well, these are objectively situations that, yes, I could have done something to influence, but really it was the other party um, taking actions or not taking actions. Mm -hmm. And that's what created this issue. And so um, I think when I was younger, I would just be more passive with those things and not bring them up or not mention them. Um, and now I'm quicker to end the relationship, the business mm -hmm. relationship over it and just say, look, this is we're misaligned here. I'm out. Smart. Although I will comment on one thing you said, my personal opinion hundred percent on you every time because mm, oh, I agree. that's one of our our company mantras or values whatever you want to call it where it's like particularly at like the partnership level and the executive level like it's always your fault even if it's like well i didn't vet them well enough to yep. be able to predict that later they were gonna fuck me over or what have you like because if if you don't assume it's always your yep. fault then you can't make optimizations right totally no look i'm i'm 100% on the same page with you on that. And I vocalize that actually quite often, uh, mm. both on the show and in my life. And uh, I think that it's also possible to have that self-awareness, recognition, um, make notes for change in the future, and simultaneously say, in addition... What an asshole this, that guy was. Ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. In addition, why did they do that thing? Like, that's, you know... Could I have picked a different person, hired differently, pre-framed a little bit more? Yes. And in some roles, 
it's not my job to babysit you through this proposition. I want to hire the right person that doesn't need to have a babysitter. 100%. And like for me, it, it I, I won't deny like there are certain, you know, mistakes that I've made or other people have made or things along the way that, you know, everybody has battle scars that you kind of accumulate doing something like what we're doing, whether you're, you know, working your way up the corporate ladder or you're building a, you know, a, an enterprise, everybody accumulates them like, and some of them really hurt. Like I still have a couple that, you know, I think about it and I go, ah, man, I wish I had done it this way or, ah, they fucked us over on that. And there's still like that bad anchor. And I just try, and I haven't mastered this by any, you know, means, but I, I'm trying to like reframe it in my mind as like, I, I think that, uh, who was it that said it? Uh, Tim Ferriss. He said, you know, that your your level of success, you know, in life can be directly att- attributed to the number of uncomfortable conversations that you've had. Mm. Well, one one could also like take that structure and apply it to like the level of success that you have. You know, to some degree, uh, can be attributed to the number of battle scars that you've accumulated, right? Like, so every battle scar is like a learning lesson, and there's nobody out there. Like, if you look at Bill Bonner, or Mark Ford, or like you know uh, Craig Clemens, the guys who've built the ten figure ventures and are in the dr world anyway which is where you know we operate you know those guys those guys have uh, I, they don't talk about it openly but i'm sure they've collected a whole number of battle scars and you know that's contributed to their success they've walked through that fire yeah i think it's also uh how quickly you resolve them right mm-hmm. and how quickly you can have something negative happen and move to the next thing mm-hmm. um one of the frameworks that i have sort of lived with over the years is People have this expression, one day we're going to laugh at this. And years ago, I thought, you know, the sooner I can make one day today, the better off I'm going to be. And so sometimes I'll have these moments that I think, oh, fuck, like that is a painful proposition or this terrible thing just happened. And within a few seconds, I think, yeah, and what am I going to do? What's my next step here? Mm. And if I can just move on past this and recognize that there is a lesson in it, um, Mm. I can grow faster, right? Grow quicker. Yeah, hundred percent. And I also like, I feel like the, the if, I've never thought of it in this way before until right now. But like, if there's a ratio, like if I if I had to think about what's the percentage, I've never really pondered this before. But what's the percentage of like events that occur in my business that are positive and kind of fun or at least neutral uh, versus like the percentage that are like, oh, this sucks. This is stressful. This is causing discomfort or pain. I mean, I feel like our ratio has got to be 97, 98% positive or neutral and then like 2% negative. So maybe another kind of framework, if you will, is to like look at that, that, um, that ratio and say, well, hey, if I'm at 50, 50, if 50% is like good and 50% is terrible, I'm doing something fucking wrong here. I got to get above yeah. 95, right? Right. Yeah, there's definitely something to that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, <laughs> we, uh, um, you know, I geek out on payment stuff because that's what I have to do professionally for a living or what I've chosen to do, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, and people ask me this question of, well, what's a, you know, what's a normal refund rate? And I'm like, yeah. well, it, it depends what kind of business you have. Like if you're in direct response selling information online, um, it might be 10, 15, 20, 30%. Mm -hmm. But if you have a coffee shop and you have a 10% refund rate, we have a fucking problem. Close the coffee shop. (laughs) Health concern. (laughs) Shut this shit down. Sure, sure, sure. Right? But it's it's very dependent on um, the model and and kind of how you operate what you do. So like that, you know, that 50-50 ratio versus 97-3, you know, Uber, for example, when they launched, was probably pretty heavy in the 50-50. You know, their largest line item for a very long time was legal because they were mm-hmm. head-to-head with um, cities, uh, states, countries about the legislation and quote-unquote right. legitimacy of their product, right? I remember So, that. yeah, I, I imagine it depends on the industry too, but um, certainly I operate better if I'm not in a 50-50 good and bad yeah. <laughs> emotional state. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that sucks. Like, uh, I mean, at this point for me, I mean, the money is a cool byproduct or side effect of like everything else, but like, it's fun to build something. It's fun to like build a machine and, and build a team and, you know, develop a culture and all these things. I used to think, here's something crazy, Brad. I used to think like when I was, my business was less developed and I had 
less, uh, you know, money to use that healthy <laughs> word. Um, is it not really money? Is it you air quoted that? Is it? I air, is it well, play, you'll see why. I play money. It okay. It's monopoly money. Um, you know, I used to. I, I had friends that were a lot more successful than me back in the day, and I still do actually. And I better. And yes. uh, they they would. They'd say to me like, because they had made all the big money by that point, right? And they they'd say, Nah, man, it's not about the money. It's about the, it's about the building a team. It's about the legacy. It's about all this shit. I'm just thinking in my head, this is some shit that rich people tell poor people to keep them poor. I don't believe that <laughs> at all. And then, lo and behold, you know, X number of years later, and I, yep. I have to say, like, accomplishing some of my bigger long-standing financial goals it's got to be the biggest that in middle age it's got to be the biggest like catalyst to triggering an existential crisis in me th- th- compared to anything else because like after i hit those goals i realized those guys who were feeding me that line of bullshit we're telling the truth like totally. uh it's not the end all be all it is about these other things and um you know that's that's been sort of a uh, an enlightening discovery that i've made you know not as of late so Wow. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that that's, uh, it's pretty commonplace to, in my life, has been commonplace to get to the next level and realize that the advice had been there the whole time and I just wasn't fucking listening. Right, right. And sometimes it it takes normalizing, right? It takes getting to a level and normalizing that life, whether it's financial or operationally in business or in sales or whatever, in a relationship. And it's an... It, you can't move on until you've normalized that level yeah. to understand the perspective of the people that had been giving you the advice at that level. Yeah, that's very, very astute, man. And t- totally agree with you. Like, I typically have to hear something three times before I listen to it, <laughs> you know, and then I'll do it once and then I'll fuck up again and go back to the old way. <laughs> and, and then I'll be like, oh shit, no, 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 I had the new way. So I usually, not always, but oftentimes, I have to make, I hate to admit this because you should only make a mistake once, but for me, I'll tend to make it twice and then I'll be like, oh no, that's it. Yeah. I like to say, uh, I'm not very good at learning from other people's mistakes, but I'm pretty good at learning from my own Mm. after I fall on my face a few times. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like that's the reality. Like everyone preaches all this, like, oh, learn from others' mistakes. Yeah, you can sometimes, but other times, as you just said, like you have to make it yourself. And sometimes, unfortunately, you have to make it, you know, more than once to really learn the lesson, you know? Well, I seem to, but uh, mm, hopefully other people, yeah, <laughs> hopefully other people have the capacity to learn from others instead. Mm. And that's sort of, you know, the, I think part of the foundation of um, doing a show like this is being able to help people make an effort to learn from other people's mistakes uh, and successes. Um, so I want to dig into some of that, but I also, uh, for the sake of foundation and understanding you a little bit better, can you give me background on your business, where you're at now, and kind of the path leading to it? Uh, sure. Well, the path, start with the path. I started off as a musical theater actor in New York. In, um, no. Really? Yeah. Yeah, my degree, which is sitting over there, it's from uh, the Boston Conservatory. I was a musical theater major at a, at a conservatory. And... Um, I don't to know York. what a conservatory is really. Uh, it seems like see, a. Did you ever yeah. see the movie uh, Whiplash? I don't remember. Okay, well, if you haven't put it on the top of your list, it's one of the best movies ever made. But uh, okay, it's 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 a cutthroat, brutal environment. It's a college specifically for the arts. There's no like liberal arts or very little. It's all like highly competitive, training you for a career in performance arts, whether it's music, dance, theater. Um, and I did that when I worked in New York for several years and actor supported myself that way. I was on a TV show on Comedy Central called Good mm. God. Um, didn't last too long. And the writing wasn't great, but it was cool uh, experience and did a bunch of theater. Um, understudied uh, a big Broadway star. So when he got sick, I went on uh, for him and uh, eventually hit some problems in that space, which I won't get into uh, right now, but um, ended up needing some side money. So I started working at a male strip club um, in New York called Hunk Mania. I started off as a massage boy, but the owner quickly figured (laughs) out that uh, I had other talents. And so uh, ended up becoming the general manager of the company within a short window of time. And, um, it's not, not where I thought you were going with other talents. 
Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, we'll leave the, uh, leave that for the next, uh, podcast, but, um, sold over 1000 man, witches during my tenure at hunk mania, it's never been beaten to my knowledge. 1000 man, which is, um, I don't know what a man, which is man. Well, I mean, use your imagination, Brad. Um, <laughs> but, uh, then, uh, I met a dude, uh, just by random occurrence and, um, ended up starting my very first business and it was in the pickup artist industry which was an emerging uh niche at that time this is probably like 2005 2006 and um just by a strange chain of events ended up becoming friends with a, a, a brilliant young marketer at the time was really quite visionary um with you know hey julian we got to learn this marketing thing now we got to learn this copywriting thing and he really kind of pushed me into that um and uh, the way I kind of got known in the pickup artist space was I uh, let me let up. me pause for yeah. pause for one sure. second because Please, yeah. I think I have a pretty good grip on this. But when mm. you say you're in the pickup artist space, you're living in this. You said DR earlier. You're living in this direct response um, business environment that is kind of a unique little niche where um, I mean it's not little, it's massive, but where you're trying to write copy or do marketing that gets the consumer to directly respond to the ad and buy something. Yeah. And when you talk about the pickup artist community specifically, you're talking about selling information to guys to learn how to pick up women. Basically, exactly. is that the that's the yes? Nutshell. I thank you. I, I assumed everyone knew that, <laughs> which is well, silly. Uh, now we know. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you put it uh, very succinctly. So um, that was how I kind of you know everyone's born into a particular industry like somehow you got into the you know deep into the processing banking world um I I because of my um you know interest in women was very interested naturally was drawn to this pickup artist space and also noticed hey there might be a business opportunity here because these a bunch of nerds are paying guys that are good with women to like teach them how and I was like I could probably do that and um, launched my first product in like 2007 or eight, I believe. And um, that's pretty much how I got into the direct response space. And as you pointed out, like for those who aren't aware of the direct response, it's pretty much those cheesy clickbaity ads that you see on like native traffic or wherever and you click through and there's this video that promises to teach you some trick and then you know 45 minutes later they still haven't told you the damn thing that's that's essentially what we do and we operate these days to 2022 we operate in several you know major verticals including survival um uh christian health men's health and we're still trying to crack financial we haven't fully done it. But with the others, with uh, in the Christian space, we have the number one offer of all time. Um, in the survival space, we have the number one offer out there right now. We're building an, um, a robust back-end machine behind that info product. An info product, obviously, is a, we're selling a book that teaches something. Um, but we're building you know, generators. We're shipping generators and water pitchers and dehydrated fu uh, food this quarter is coming out. So we're building a nice machine behind that. And um, and then men's health, which is essentially supplements for men. Um, and then financial, as I said, still haven't fully cracked financial. But we're coming. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. Um, all right. I want to ask you, I want to pick that, pick the model apart a little bit. Uh, I think uh, shine some light on it. But yeah. can you give me an idea of rough numbers in terms of both size of staff or revenue or whatever you want to share? Yeah. Um, so I, I'll just say it. Like, listen, first off. So this year will probably, depending on how the rest of Q4 goes, historically Q4 is not our strongest quarter. It's actually our worst quarter uh, because everyone's buying up inventory to sell their little Christmas gadgets and everything. So the cost of media does tend to skyrocket. Uh, also email deliverability drops as well. So if you're doing mm -hmm. a lot of paid media drops to email lists, right? Deliverability kind of takes a hit, but we think we've found, I'm not going to tell you where, but some really great pockets of traffic that don't seem to be saturated by this kind of, uh, you know, the big Q4 buyers this year, I think we'll hit about 55 million top line. Um, if Q4 goes really well, a little North of that, if it goes shitty, a little South, um, but 55 is what we're projecting by the end of this year. Um, however, we all know that top line is such a fucking vanity metric. Everybody pops out their top line. Everyone slaps out their dick on the table, right, to show <laughs> it. But the fact is, 
who gives a fuck? I got a buddy that uh, I, I, I'll never say who, of course, but the guy did insane numbers on an offer that if you're even remotely related to the DR world, you know what this offer is. The, the guy did nine figures in less than a year. Man, they're still, they're, they owe like a million dollars, okay? Mm. They didn't fucking make anything off that shit mm -hmm. because of a couple of miscalculations related to inventory and et cetera. So like when somebody tells you, oh, we did 55 million or whatever, we'll say, well, what's your margin on that? Because that's the real, that's the name of the game, right? What mm -hmm. are we doing this for? Um, so with that said, I, I believe this year we will, we've reinvested a fair amount back into the business, but in distributable profit, we'll probably 13, 14 million this year, um, which we're very proud of. We're awesome. hard for that shit. It's our, it's our strongest year yet. And um, what else was I supposed to? Number of employees, team, roughly. Team, team, mm -hmm. thank you. So we have, it's about 50 50 right now, where we have, I think I'm going to say 26 kind of core team that's divided up into multiple departments like operations and traffic and uh, finance and creative. Um, that's about 26 people, maybe 27 now. And then we also have the, the similar number. I think it's about 25 people that are full-time customer service reps that are just sitting there answering calls and also doing some outbound. So it's, so if you count customer service, which I guess you probably should since they're full-time, we're just over 50 people right now. Cool. Okay. That's awesome. So uh, for people that don't recognize you are a marketer and the language that gets used in the marketing space uh, is unique for people that are not in the marketing space. Um, so offers, um, the spaces that you're in, just the whole framework of how you think about things and orchestrating your business, um, I think is uh, not everybody gets it. So mm. I want to kind of try to uh, put it in an envelope. Um, your whole business is, it sounds like, uh, well, and actually I want you to guide me through this, but it sounds like you first start by started by picking verticals where you knew that you could find an avatar, a client to sell to, um, and then figured out one product that you could sell. And then maybe over time found other products where you could enhance the lifetime value of that customer. Is that where you started with, cause you talked about men's health and then Christian health and survival. Those were the categories you gave me. Mm. Um, and then you use language that was, I have the best offer, which basically is you found a product that sells and you're driving that specific product to that space. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yes, that's accurate. So I'll, I'll reverse engineer. I'll go back to the first thing. In, in terms of like how my trajectory in this, as I mentioned, I started off as a pickup artist, right? Essentially in our, the DR world, what we'd call, I guess, a guru. I hate that word, by the way, now. But I was like, you know, a guru um, in that world, especially in New York. And I was good at it, too. I was A lot of those guys were like kind of, you know, frauds, not me. Um, point <laughs> being is that as I went through that phase at a certain point, real marketers, right, started to infiltrate that kind of growing niche. Real marketers like Evan Pagan, maybe people, listeners mm -hmm. don't know who the fuck that is, but he's a Double great marketer. Dating. Double your dating. He's uh, he was Craig Clemens' mentor. He was a uh, Golden Hippo, which is a you know billion dollar company now. Point being is that uh, real marketers started to infiltrate the space. So we were like, shit, we better, better learn marketing, right? If you can't beat them, join them. And we did that. Then by two th in 2010, we launched an offer called Pandora's Box, which to this day is the best selling dating advice offer of all time. Did about 35 million dollars in 2012. Top line. I didn't get a penny of that shit. That's another story. I wrote or wrote a, probably half the offer or half the VSL for it. VSL, video sales letter. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. I'm learning. Anyway, <laughs> by 2015, the, the pickup space, the seduction space had basically peaked. For whatever reason, some niches like weight loss or survival, like they're always popping. It's always a new product, new mechanism, new promise that worked. For whatever reason, pickup, the seduction space had this huge spike and then it kind of petered off and I don't want to say died, but it's, you know, it's never, its peak was 2012, 13 for that space. So in 2015, I was like, yo, we've learned all this. I was off on my own, doing my own shit. I was like, we learned all this cool 
you know, these cool buzzwords in the seduction space, like that converted, that sold well to prospects. We knew the price points. We knew all this cool stuff. So I formed my own little ragtag pirate ship team and we launched the first gay seduction offer. It's called. Really? Yeah. It's the first ever. It's called straight bait. Find out if he's curious. <laughs> <laughs> That's super interesting. <laughs> so no, but for real, I'm not kidding. In fact, I changed the tagline eventually to. Did you actually have a pirate ship too? No, no, just in my own head. That's too bad. But, yeah. uh, you were in uh, New York. You could have. Yeah. Could have, should have, would have. But uh, the uh, the tagline eventually straight bait, which basically the promise of that product, right? It's a concept, right? I knew that like how to pick up girls, how to get laid, how to get a girlfriend, that that would work to the, to the straight audience. Right. But you can't say that to the gay audience. Cause you know, let's be frank for gay guys, for most gay guys, it's pretty easy to get laid. We, I had to give them something that was a little bit more, uh, you know, bragging rights, a little bit more forbidden fruit, a little bit more mm. kind of cool straight guys, gay guys. I don't know if you know this, gay guys, a lot of gay men, really like straight guys. That's how straight bait was born. Eventually the tagline changed to, if it doesn't feel gay, you can go all the way. Anyway, <laughs> point is that that became a big hit in the gay uh, space. So that, and, and by this point, I realized, man, all right, I'm becoming like a real marketer now. And within a couple of years, I had developed what I considered enough kind of skill sets to like write and copy, um, long form copy, video production, kind of building a, a simple website that uses this video, this VSL as the sales engine, right? Where everything hinges upon the performance of that video. It's like an infomercial. And uh, met my partner, to the, my now partner, Andrew Contreras in 2018. And it was like, all right, we've developed these skills. He had developed skills. I developed skills. Let's start expanding. Let's see if we can make this work in, uh, you know, the, uh, the the health space or the Christian space or the, the survival space. Eventually, the skills we you can superimpose these skills into any vertical practically. That's mm -hmm. that's pretty much. Does that give you like a fair kind of um, snapshot of like how we got sucked into this? Yeah, yeah, and it's awesome. I mean, we so as as I think you know, Easy Peter Act is pretty heavily involved in processing payments for yeah. lots of direct response marketers. But I I wanted to highlight it and I wanted to talk about it because the the first of all, tons of people build a strong company leaning on one pillar, and then they you know they have one sales channel or one mechanism that they grow through, and they are completely blind. To this other wide range of um, marketing channels, uh, you know, sales mechanisms or methodologies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I I love um, being able to dig into the path that established companies can use to open the door for something else. Uh, that's number one. Two is that the way that marketers think and the way that you grew was on the cornerstone of understanding the marketing uh, framework, not, hey, I've got this product I love that I want to push to the world, or I've got a unique selling proposition that I can, that's going to serve this community. And maybe that's a little bit of it, but it was that you knew a formula and you thought, okay, well, where else can I apply the formula? Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, um, I think that many business people don't look at it that way. It's specifically this category of direct response marketers that tend to do that. Can you give like, I, I'm because I'm curious now, I, I feel like to some degree, you might be talking about a, a little bit of like an archetype of people that you know, or might listen to your mm. show. <laughs> Can you give like an example of like, without getting into, you know, too many specifics, obviously, but like, like an example of the type of person or entrepreneur that you're talking about? Which on, on which side, the traditional business owner or the marketing the tra person? Traditional, traditional business owner. Um, sure. Uh, so let's say uh, Fit Aid, right? So I'm drinking a Fit Aid, and I uh, they're good friends of mine. Mm. Uh, love them, um, and they're actually a little bit different, but I'll, they're a reasonable example. They launched the product kind of as an offer, sort of similar to what we're talking about, except. They had a fundamental idea on the front end, which was we want a healthier, um, cleaner beverage uh, for people. And so 
they created a, a product and the only way that they distributed was, well, it was direct to consumer and through CrossFit gyms. Mm. But that was the whole marketing model was we're going to sell it on our website and we're going to have this strategic partnership with gyms and push it out through the CrossFit stores. And they had, there's mm. actually a pretty interesting, unique way that they were doing it. But what they weren't doing was traditional distribution, mm. right? And they weren't going down these other paths like, to get like the, retailers and, you, you know, you got it, yeah, right? Yeah. Like getting in Whole Foods, getting in a GNC. And eventually they did that. Right. But it wasn't the first path. It was like the next chapter of marketing. And it was the next chapter of marketing the same product as mm -hmm. opposed to, hey, we've figured out how to do um, direct response with a canned beverage. Why don't we get into alcohol? Why don't we get mm -hmm. into a sleep supplement beverage? Why don't we get into, you know, a hippie vertical with some other nuanced substances? Right. Whatever. Yeah. Right. That would be sort of the example of taking the one skill set and expanding it versus taking the product and business that you love and then trying to um, just grow that one thing. Yeah. No, that's a great, great description of it. I, the, the only it? Thing I, know, I feel like I was struggling. No, no, that. no. I, th I think you got, you got it across, man. You got it across. I, I put you on the spot a little bit with it, but I think it was a great explanation. The only thing I know about the, the beverage industry is that I watch Shark Tank. I love that show. Uh, but uh, the sharks are always scared shitless of like beverages. If someone comes in with a beverage, they're like, that's the hardest space in the world. And they, yeah. they rarely get a, get a deal. So, Well, to, uh, to FitAid's uh, credit, it's even harder to go beverage direct response because the weight of the product is so right. heavy that shipping right. costs are terrible. Yeah. So, you know, you think about like running ads to sell information online when you have no um, hard tangible costs or hard variable costs. It's just how much can you spend on ads to get it to convert if you're doing paid, right? If you're going for mm. paid ads, um, you eliminate a lot of that profit as soon as, as soon as you decide that the cans actually cost a ton to ship, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. I mean, you know, I don't know what their original vision was like or purpose for kind of launching that. I bet it was, probably like a really noble kind of goal. <laughs> uh, you know, not to say I won't ever, you know, have a noble goal, but like for me, and I, I, people are so like weird about saying this openly, but like this was always a way, a mechanism for me to make a lot of fucking money. That's what yes. it was. And I know that sounds like kind of superficial and even sort of selfish, but man, at least I'm fucking honest with myself. The thing I don't like is people that are out there virtue signaling left and right, but, you know, molesting kids in the closet, you know, at nighttime, you know, like at least I'm aware of why I'm doing this. And, and, um, and for me, money is just like freedom anyway to like do what the fuck I want. Um, and like, you know, meet girls. <laughs> Uh, well, I think that in, in many, many, many areas of life, uh, clear expectations, uh, resolve frustration for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. so I think that if you are, like you said, virtual virtue signaling, uh, to be doing something for some greater good, uh, you're going to find tremendous friction internally and misalignment internally. And other people can see that and feel it. Um, if that's not actually why you're doing it. And so mm -hmm. if you're actually doing it for money, just having the self-awareness, realization, and integrity to say, I'm doing it for money, resolves tons of this internal conflict and turmoil. And other people tend to have um, an easier time with it when they're like, oh, I appreciate your honesty. And maybe they'll mm. talk shit anyway, but I don't know. And let them. Let them talk right. shit. But, but you know, just to add on to that, Brad, and I, I don't want to go off on a tangent here with you, but, uh, <laughs> Too late. you know, like, I, I, fair, I have met, like, particularly like in our world, in the world of direct response copywriters, right? Which are the, the guys and the girls that are writing these long form stories and using all sorts of psychological manipulation when it's done well, okay? Um, to sort of get, put a prospect on an emotional roller coaster and tap into their pain and then show them this promised land of the future, right? I've I've heard a number of these copywriters who who do stuff like this, some of them at least extremely well, and they're sitting there preaching, you know, on their, you know, whatever 
clubhouse or whatever when that was a thing um about like oh you know morality and ethics and this and your copy and i'm like motherfucker i've seen your sales pitches okay me thinks the lady doth protest too much like be honest with yourself okay we know what what direct response copywriters do which is you know we are sort of weavers of of uh of bullshit to some degree and now of course make a good product make a good product and you know honor your refund policy and and don't make claims that can get you in trouble uh and don't be too aggressive on your billing right there's all these these other parameters here ethical moral reasons but of course like to preserve your business but at the same time like i just know a number of total fucking hypocrites that are in our world like be honest with yourself we know what we do we know why we do this don't fucking lie to yourself you can lie to everybody else don't lie to your fucking self yeah well i think that that's the uh cornerstone of happiness and um growth as a person is self-awareness and if you're yeah. consistently pushing out some other message, look, it's real easy to say something a number of times and then forget that you are lying, right? Like if you're pushing out a message and not like explicitly lying, maybe it is, but if you're just slightly misaligned, you say something enough times, you're going to program yourself mm. to have that belief internally. And eventually you're going to be like, oh, wait, <laughs> that's not actually how I felt, you know, right. X years ago. Yeah, um, no. Okay, so yeah, yeah. we're down this rabbit hole, but I want to I want to talk a little bit about the the function of your business because mm. you know fifty five million, um, fifty employees is a sizable business, and uh, I want to hear about how it's changed over time and mm. some of the we can talk copy, we can talk operations, whatever. But when you started and you were doing the pickup artist, the dating community, uh, and that was the first offer, and you had figured out how to get this thing to convert. Did you systemize that process? Did you have kind of a framework for this is the end thing I want to sell and I'm going to back into the messaging? Or how do you think about the construction of the marketing message around a given product? Well, you know, if we if we look back to 10 years ago, right, like the the offers that I launched 10 years ago compared to the offers that and of course, an, an offer is just as. Brad pointed out it's just a sales page with a product for sale and then a shopping cart. It's it's the offer that I'm making to get you to buy my product, essentially, right? Um, at least that's how I think of it. If I if I compare like the offers that we launched or the products that we launched 10 years ago compared to now and the actual marketing, like the flow of that funnel, people know what a funnel is, right? It's like a yeah. <laughs> series of fucking web pages. Um I hope so. Uh, the, yeah, if if I they haven't changed, it hasn't changed that much. Like back then, ten years ago, there was a VSL on a landing page, a video sales letter. Yeah, the production value was a lot lower. Maybe the copy wasn't as strong. But um, then it was a cart page. Then it was a, an upsell one and an upsell two, and then it was a thank you page, and that's it. And today, ten years later, it's essentially the same thing. Um, the difference is. Back then, it was like, you know, me and two or three other people. It was a small little ragtag team, as I mentioned. But now it's 50 people. So what's really, really changed is behind the curtain, okay? Mm. It's, the, it's the infrastructure that's changed that's allowing us to take that process of writing a VS, doing the market research, writing a VSL, developing a product, whether it be a supplement or a, or a book or what have you, and replicating it faster putting out instead of one offer every 12 months, three offers per quarter, right? And more, there's more strategy where like, hey, this product, this VSL, this offer is really crushing on this, uh, you know, these three traffic sources, on these two native sources, on media buys. Let's devote some bandwidth, some creative bandwidth to developing a suite of backend products now to bump our lifetime value of those customers. Now, as we increase our lifetime value, we can adjust our allowable CPA, which is essentially our allowable customer acquisition cost, right? So instead of a hundred bucks, it's 140 bucks or what have you. So there's more strategy and there's more infrastructure to basically replicate this cookie cutter process faster more frequently and we have a lot more compared to back then because our revenue is so much higher now um we're also more 
vulnerable to threats, right? So we have, it's not perfect, but we have a lot more sort of defense in place. I never thought about defense 10 years ago. I didn't need it really. Mm -hmm. um, now we have a lot more defense. You know, we've got, we go back and forth with legal on scripts to make sure we're not going to get in trouble. We go back and forth with our traffic team on traffic compliance, regulatory compliance with legal, uh, customer service QAing, making sure that, you know, People are getting promptly refunded. So we're, we're checking all of our customer service team and a million other things to try and protect and preserve, preserve the business as we go to the next level. So it's mostly behind the curtain that's changed, but the actual structure of the offer, what's visible to the naked eye of the prospect, it's essentially identical. I dig it. So originally you were, uh, and you have a reputation for um, the copywriter. Mm. And you were putting together the pieces and saying, hey, this is the product I'm selling. This is how uh, I'm going to walk somebody through the process of buying it. I'm going to create the offer. Um, are you still writing the offers today? So, yeah, sort of. Um, we have six writers on staff now. Um, and technically, I think we actually have nine. But we have like – we have – three additional writers, two or three additional writers, I believe that write content for us. Like that's for our emails, like actually like giving them content. And then we have six writers, uh, myself included that write the promotional sales material, like, like a video sales letter or, a or an upsell letter or anything that gets converts someone into a customer or sells them something else. Uh, so we have a team of writers. I'm, I now spend probably more of my time, less of my time writing and more of my time working with our other writers, you know, just kind of giving feedback and saying, this is good. Like, in fact, right before our, our podcast today, I was on a call with the creative team, just kind of giving feedback on um, some new ads that they just wrote and uh, just going through what, what their stuff and finding out what they're working on and I guess it's closer to a copy chief position, but I still like writing. I still like putting myself on the front lines, going up against the other writers on the team. And, um, you know, that's where the, the adrenaline rush is, you know? So, uh, sure. Um, and I think, I think part of that is that it's where you grew up, right? Mm -hmm. Your adrenaline rush is there because, well, maybe because you love it, but maybe also because it was where you got the initial rewards for your behaviors and business. Um, so you've got some anchor to success means I, I successfully write this thing. Um, yet before we started recording, you said, um, what's funny is that I'm known for copywriting yet the further I personally get away from copy, the more our business has grown. Yeah. Well, what are, I, I, what are the yeah. things that you did differently? What are the things that have changed that you're spending your time on now? Um, that aren't copy. And you mentioned sort of coaching other copywriters, maybe editing as part of that, right? The chief copy person. Um, yeah. What else uh, do you do today that you think is uh, an anchor in your success to go from, you know, whatever, 10 million to 55? Uh, you know, it's funny, like my, my partner and I, our roles have really diverged, you know, and, and contrasted, you know, as we've gained more experience, like he's the chief executive officer for the company. He's, become, I think, a fabulous world-class CEO. Um, he started off as a writer too, but mm. now, but he's a much more structured thinker uh, than I am. He's more organized. He was an engineer before he got into any of this stuff. So I had a very high level engineer. Um, that's not how my brain's more all over the place. And um, you don't say. yeah, right. And uh, so I, the, the other areas that I've really kind of, somebody once said, you know, figure out in life, figure out what you suck at and then don't do it, right? Which I think there's a lot of wisdom to it. And I think my business kind of puttered along for quite a few years and I was doing one to two million a year top line, right? Um, and that the breakthrough for me was, you know what? I'm not a great CEO. Um, and it took me like eight years to figure that out, of course. But, you know, I'm not a great CEO. Uh, let me... Fine. I suck actually. Let me find someone who a partner, perhaps who's better than me at that. And I think coming to terms with these are the areas I'm not good at. And these couple of things are what I am good at. And this is where I should hyper-focus for me, obviously the creative, the copywriting, um, these days biz dev, man, 
like sourcing opportunities for the business, sourcing connections for the business. I met you, uh, met a bunch of other people at War Room. And um, not only that, but I've sourced numerous, sourced and developed relationships with numerous doctors now for our company or our spokespeople. Um, and numerous, uh, you know, like super talented employees I've found. So the biz dev side is something that I really like doing. Um, I've, I've shown a knack for it, just going out, meeting people. Uh, I, I think, I hate to admit this, but I think it, it has all the pickup artist shit from years ago has mm. played into it where I like, I've, I'm not afraid or I am afraid, but I've, I conquer my fear of just walking up to somebody at, at a conference and say, Hey, I'm Julian Reyes and just shake their hand and, and just kind of move in for that. So biz dev strategy. I love strategy. Like I, I played chess growing up. I, uh, I, I love reading about great generals and, you know, like Napoleon and Alexander and Caesar and all those guys. I like reading about those guys. So to me, business, you know, there's an element of war to it, right? Like I hate to, to even admit this, but it's war. Like you're compared, that's, that's how I view it. And it's fun for me to view it in that way. I don't feel like bad about it. I feel like it's war. Now, of course, we have our alliances and we have our enemies and the greatest enemies inside of ourselves, of course, right? But it's like, it's cool to kind of plant, like look at all the angles and then, well, what if they do this? What if we do that? Uh, so the strategy part, I really enjoy. So really strategy, biz dev, creative, and that's it. That's really like mm. where I've, I've hyper-focused and everything else I've, not everything else, but almost everything else I've successfully delegated or gotten off of my plate. I have somebody else that manages my email now. I have somebody else that opens my physical mail. Like any of that shit that sucks away at my mental bandwidth, like I'm trying to delegate that just so I can put more energy into, into you know, the areas that I'm really strong. And most of them, I'm not. Yeah, I, there are uh, uh, different philosophies on that. And uh, mm -hmm. it's hard to argue with... Um, doubling down on the thing that's working, uh, as a mechanism for growth. So, all right, I'd be, uh, I, I have to ask because we've had these conversations and I, I want, I just want the story for myself, <laughs> mm. uh, as a, as a direct response marketer, have you run into merchant account problems? Ha! I think you know the answer to this. So, so the way, <laughs> obviously, Brad, the way that you and I kind of like, I spent more time with you at, at war room than probably I spent a good amount of time with Perry and, uh, with Amanda, but you and me like hit it off because I, even though I'm not technically like a processing guy, um, but I'm a merchant and an advertiser, you know, you and I hit it off because like, I love talking about talking shop about merchant accounts. And as soon as I found out, Oh, this guy's deep into the merchant account game. I was like, Oh, let's talk about merchant accounts all fucking day. And that's what we did. We just kind of got drunk and just talked about merchant accounts. And yes, to answer your question, yes. And we talked about it in person. Uh, we've had all sorts of merchant account issues, man. I mean, I, I got my first mid or merchant account in 2010. And, you know, we're definitely like, how do I, I'm trying to, I don't want to say too much here, but we've learned, <laughs> we've made, we've made mistakes, you know, in the merchant account game. Like some advertisers, they have one Stripe account or whatever, and they like blow it up really big and they never have any issues, things like that in the, arenas that we play in uh typically there are higher refund rates higher chargeback rates right and the merchant account game we were talking before about like playing defense right like in, as your business grows and and protecting yourself from vulnerabilities uh it didn't take me long to realize years and years ago that merchant accounts it might be for at least in our type of our arena might be the biggest vulnerability right? Because you got some fucking dickhead behind a desk, you know, with a pair of glasses on. I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm getting LASIK <laughs> next week, by the way. But uh, so I won't have to wear these anymore. Point is, it's some fucking dick behind a desk that's like, oh, this guy is selling a product that teaches gay guys how to bang straight guys? Axum. You know, we had that happen, by the way. Um, like, we were approved. We were running really good volume for like six months. Then the wrong guy, you know, got hired in the risk department at the acquire or something and, or at the processor level. And, and, um, boom, we just like got shut off. I was like, what the hell, man, that's messed up. So it, it didn't take me long to realize, Oh, I've got to learn like no black boxes. It's another like 
business kind of mantra that that we follow. Like I don't, I want to understand everything at least in every aspect of my business well enough to where I can hire the right person or or you know make some kind of strategic decisions about it. And um, that's one of the, the the that is I think possibly the biggest vulnerability because if you make a mistake, like your whole business is in somebody else's hands. And mm -hmm. in our world, you know, the agents, a lot of agents, you know, they operate in obscurity, right? They don't tell you all the fees. They say, oh, I'm going to give you a great deal. But then you actually crunch the numbers on your statement and you see, holy shit, you take all your, all your fees and you divide it by your, your, you know, gross revenue that you ran through it, and you realize these guys are taking 10% of, of my top line revenue. Okay. So like if you're, if you have a 20% margin to your business, the bank or really the broker plus the processor plus the acquirer plus Visa MasterCard, are, are, they're your 50-50 business partner, like mm -hmm. in the high risk world where, where we tend to operate. So very quickly, I realized big vulnerability, like I'm going to master this shit. So I've been doing it for, for 12 years now. I don't claim to be a master, but as as you know i know more than the average like business owner i think about it and it's because uh of the vulnerability that it represents and the opportunity to gain margin like if you like have your your merchant accounts like set up right you know you're you're going to have a higher and you know all this better than i do you're going to have a higher cart page conversion rate because you're going to have less declines right more a higher approval ratio which is huge to the bottom line you're gonna have less chargebacks less fees you're gonna be paying less to the banks if you negotiate the right deal maybe you have no reserves right so all these little little levers you can pull with the right relationship and the right information to squeeze more margin out of your business so yes i am also a merchant account nerd master brad <laughs> well i you know you said something that i thought was kind of interesting uh that isn't highlighted very often because you you use the language uh, squeeze more margin out. Uh, but one of the things that you illustrated was uh, I think most people when they hear that think about especially in credit card processing are like, well, what's my rate? Let me get let me get a better rate. This is what you know. Uh, usually, more novice business owners say that's the language. Mm -hmm. um, but what you pointed out was if you have the right merchant account provider set up, improving your decline rate is a way to increase your margin, right? It's very common once people get the ball rolling with business years in for their decline rates to start increasing, right? And said another way, you know, if 100 people come to your page and try to check out, at one point in business, maybe 95 of them got approved. And then over time, that goes down to 88 getting approved. And when you're really aggressive in marketing, that can slip further. And those are things that it's not because the person didn't have uh, money on their card. It's because somebody in the payment chain is proactively declining the transaction, thinking that it might be fraud. Yeah. And so those things are really important when you get into high velocity businesses like yours, where you're selling yeah. a whole bunch of lower dollar amount products. Can um, I nerd out? Can I nerd out with you on this for two seconds? Can we, oh, like, please. Get, in, can we get into this shit? All right. Sure, so yeah. like. I've noticed a trend um, like a year ago today, our approval ratios. So, so we have a lot of merchant accounts. OK, I'm not going to say how many, but it's a lot and um, more than all the fingers and toes on both of our bodies combined. And I don't know why my brain went there. Point is, is that we have a lot of merchant accounts. And a year ago today, our approval rates, you know, we had some accounts that were like kind of crappy, whatever, like call it 60 to 70 percent uh approval ratio on the front end uh, mm -hmm. that's the first the first purchase and but then our better accounts were like over 90 percent approval right like that was hot fast forward a year to today our best accounts are just above 80 on a front end approval just that's our best accounts and most of our accounts are like 60 to 70 and then we had some we have some outliers on the shitty end that are like <laughs> like 45 percent obviously we've pulled volume from like the 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 crappier accounts and point it you know point it to the better accounts i've seen so two two thoughts brad one i have seen this kind of stark trend of like declines increasing across the board on on front end and back end i mean 
I've talked to other advertisers in different spaces. They've some of them that I've talked to have noticed something similar. And I've also noticed on our because I've analyzed our declines, uh, uh, a sharp increase in pickup card, which I guess is like stolen fucking credit card. But here's the thing. I, I suspect, based on all the information I've learned, I could be wrong. You correct me if I'm wrong. You are the master. But uh, I suspect that these pickup card kind of um, codes that we're getting on declines, which indicate a stolen card, are actually not stolen cards. It's the issuing banks that have tightened up their algorithms to such yes. an extent that – they're, they're, we're actually just getting issuer declines and they're just labeling it as a stolen card. Yes. But in reality, it's not. That's my. What, what do you think about my crazy thesis here? Yeah, it's not crazy at all. It's 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 almost not disputable. So um, I'll uh, simplify, which is everybody in the payments ecosystem, and there are a bunch of players here. There are the banks that issue credit cards. So like, you know, Capital One, Bank of America, your local bank, they issue credit cards. Those are card issuers. Then our side of the world is credit card acquirers. Those are the ones that allow you to uh, have a merchant account, right? Um, then there's a payment gateway and a shopping cart. And those are softwares that help facilitate the transaction. Um, and then you've got the card brands like Visa and MasterCard and Discover that are involved. Um, and then you have actually the the network that the transaction runs on. Um, and most people don't even know the names of the networks that these run on. But like First Data Omaha, First Data Nashville, um, people might know the name First Data, but those are the, the networks. So all these different players have different incentives to prevent fraud. And the core the, the core reason for it from a card issuer perspective is that if a fraudulent transaction goes through on your credit card as a consumer, all you have to do is call the bank that issued your credit card, call your credit card company and say, nope, that was a fraudulent transaction. And then you don't have to pay for it. But you know who does pay for it? The card issuing bank. So the bank that issued the credit card absorbs that loss um, in, a, in a very real way. So they want to proactively prevent this from happening. Um, so they have incentive to decline transactions that are going through your business merchant account if they suspect it's fraud. Now, here's, here's the hook. Here's the crux of the whole thing. Those card issuing banks, every time a transaction gets declined and is uh, marked as fraudulent, they save that data in what's called the TC40 report. And mm -hmm. they bank the data and say, hey, Julian's company had a decline transaction marked as fraud at 11.53 p.m. on a Tuesday night. And they aggregate this data over and over and over over time, and they build patterns with it. And they say, hey, the card was located in this area at this time with Julian Company ABC, and they roll it up. And over time, they build rules that say, you know what, next time a card comes through at 1152 on a Tuesday it, with Julian's business name, automatically decline it. Wow. And so those rules tighten up over time. And so it's actually really, really normal to see approval rates decrease the longer your merchant account is open, no matter what. And it's that's not to say that you can just open up any merchant account and suddenly the problem's gonna be fixed, but new DBA, new merchant account, uh, categorized as the right industry type, those things all matter. Because you know statistically, like the industry, for example, statistically, uh, if you're selling supplements and you're categorized as uh, a nutritional store, brick and mortar, versus five nine um, six eight or whatever right yeah, sure. right versus these categories that are known for more aggressive marketing online statistically one of them does have a higher likelihood of fraud and so all these little nuances matter to optimize the way you accept payments but a good a good rule after our little payment rant here is that um the longer a merchant account is open the more likely you are to have more declines than are actually happening and so you can optimize that. So if you've been in business 10 years and you've had the same merchant account for a while and you're noticing that you have an 88% decline or 88% approval rate and it used to be 95, it might just be that you need somebody to help clean that up. And is that because the TC40 data has accumulated to the degree that the issuers can kind of say, oh, we don't want this one? Yes, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. And yeah. some of that is, you know, uh, some of it is um, speculative, right? This is the hypothesis that we have, but there's a ton of data to support this. Um, and it also depends, like it gets really granular because it depends uh, which issuing bank it is. 
So like you might have as uh, somebody selling men's health, you're selling to consumers, you might find out that, um, you know, a disproportionate amount of the transactions come from Bank of America cards or from mm -hmm. Chase cards or whatever. And when you start to break things down by a category like that, you'll have different approval rates by issuing bank. And I sometimes, bank, yeah. yeah, that'll illustrate it really clearly. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. Right. But it's kind of, you know, it's it's picking apart <laughs> this crazy chaos um, to try to optimize those things. So let me, let me ask you this, Brad, because he, here's another trend. Here's another wild theory I have, which this one may be wrong, but like the conventional wisdom that things that I had sort of always heard. And I love that we're nerding out on this. We probably just lost half the audience, but whatever. <laughs> we'll see what suckers. remains. Yeah. We'll see the four people that are left. But um you know, the conventional wisdom was like I, I had always sort of heard similar to what you just said, which is like, well, hey, if you tweak your MCC code or you change the descriptor, you open up a new account, like there's all these like little tweaks that you can do. You know, I was I did an MCC code analysis, which is the merchant category code, right? Like what you're are you a brick and mortar selling, you know, men's supplements like a GNC or are you selling subscription trial, right? So they give you like a little code, four digit code. I had always heard that, well, you know, you can tweak all these little things, but I did an MCC code analysis. I did not on all of our accounts. And we, I have the luxury of, obviously we have a lot of accounts so we can kind of see, you know, our approval rates by MCC. I did not notice any like trend that certain MCC codes were better than others. In some cases, like a crappy MCC code or crappier MCC code was performing well, when in other cases, like a, a good MCC code in theory was performing like badly. And my only sort of, not to say that those things don't play a role, but ultimately what my conclusion was, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Brad, is it's the bin that fucking matters, right? Like we were looking at it and just like, we got to, I'm not going to say which processor, but we got a couple of accounts with a pretty well-known processor and the approval rates were like 45%. And we just couldn't send volume to it. But then with a different processor with X acquirer on the back end, like, like we have certain bins just perform better than others. And, and it seems like to me, that's the, the biggest determining factor on your approval ratio. Is that dumb? Is that smart? What do you think? It's a part of the equation. And so for the sake of illustration, bin is bank identification number. And I think uh, what will help you and anybody else that has this issue is all banks have a bin. All banks have a bank identification number. And what you're referencing is the bin for a merchant account. So it identifies the backend bank that's actually facilitating credit card processing. The, the, the acquirer's bin, bin right? The yep. acquirer's bin, and yeah. The synonym for acquirer is sponsor bank or member bank, right? Same thing. And that is functionally the backend bank that handles the credit card processing. Um, the first few digits of your merchant ID number for your merchant account indicate the bin, indicate the bank that is actually holding that merchant account. But the other banks that have bins are card issuing banks. And the first few digits of your credit card indicate the bin that issued your credit card. In both situations, the issuing bank and the merchant account, uh, they're looking at the MCC code as indicative of uh, fraud and whether or not they should control for fraud by declining transactions. Um, you might find that in an aggressive MCC code, Chase treats that MCC code differently than Bank of America for card mm. issuing. Ah. And, you, and similarly, you might find that um, merchant account provider A versus merchant account provider v, uh, B also treat the MCC code differently. Um, and that and this could is, be what, why I'm seeing the discrepancy between MCCs. Right. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, and one, you know, one of the challenges there is that you want to be if if you're in a uh, if you're processing payments online. Period. You want to be working with a provider that actually understands your business model. You want a merchant account provider that understands your business model. Uh, but as you go further down the path of high risk, it wouldn't surprise me to find that you have some of the really aggressive credit card processors that say, hey, yeah, absolutely, we'll board anybody. We'll take you for high risk. Um, one of the ways they're controlling for fraud or controlling their risk is just by declining more transactions. And that's absolutely a possibility. Um, so 
I think that you're, I think you're spot on, but it's also just one part of the whole equation, right? It's the, it's the whole equation you're looking for. Yeah. And the whole equation is made up of the, uh, the acquirer's bin, the MCC code, the DBA. What else, what else am I missing here? Size of transaction, the location of the buyer, um, the history of your account over time, subscription mm. or not subscription industry, if you didn't say that, which is MCC, I suppose. Yeah. And so there could be, you know, there's also data points around your URL and keyword scraping on your site is a possibility. So you might be in a specific MCC, but you might have, you know, like we, uh, we have tools that run keyword analysis on sites to scrub that for G- G2. That's one of them. Yeah. It's one of the platforms mm. that does that. Mm. Uh, but it scrubs for what's actually being sold on the site and it helps prevent fraudulent merchants, right? Did somebody come in and say, Hey, yeah, we're selling supplements and then they're selling weed, you know, mm. uh, on the back end, which nobody can process for as of October, 2022. Unfortunately. <laughs> well, funny enough, <laughs> we are actually, as of yesterday, um, one of the first providers to be able to open transparent merchant accounts for Kratom and Kratom had been, uh, not allowed uh, by merchant account providers um, for years. It's been up oh, and really? down for years. Yeah. I got a big, I got a big guy for you. Then um, he's oh, been trying it. to. He's he's got a whole chain of kratom stores, and uh, he's been trying to find processing. He found a couple. He was masking, you know, which is like he got approved for selling, you know, flowers, <laughs> you know, like right. roses, but exactly. it's really fucking kratom. Yeah. <laughs> fun fun fact. I'll make an admission. I just quit kratom. After like eight years of using Kratom, I actually just quit like a month and a half ago, um, mainly because I was like, the, the reason I quit, have you ever tried Kratom? Yes. It's fucking awesome. Um, it's great. Love, love Kratom. But I went to, I spent three months in Europe just this past quarter and I got to Spain. I was like, I got enough Kratom for like two and a half more days. I'm like, it gives me enough time to go buy some more Kratom. Kratom's fucking illegal. I had no idea, and I was in I'm Spain. Still in Spain, I'm supposed to be there for like six more weeks, so I was like, oh, like fuck it, I guess I'll just quit and uh, just spread it out, wean myself off of it. Kratom's fun, but the thing that sucks about kratom, it's it's one of those sort of you know quote unquote drugs that uh, it's fun to do. It doesn't really have any major side effects. Getting off, it's a bitch. That's the only thing. But um, traveling is like a pain in the ass. Like in some countries, it's like illegal. So. I just got off of it. Quit vaping. Quit vaping too. Oh, that's good, man. That's good. Uh, uh. Yeah, that's good. Well, we're all over the place. Uh, but uh, I, let me ask you, because as somebody that's gone through the merchant account um, issues, uh, what would you suggest for a business owner? Do you think that, uh, you know, what do business owners need to know about <laughs> merchant accounts? Call Brad. <laughs> Call Brad. Um, <laughs> you know, I think as you alluded to earlier in this call, uh, I think it all depends on what it is you're doing. You know, like what are you selling? What's the market you're selling to? Um, You know, the biggest, it's funny, like, you know, I'm part of some of these marketing groups on like Facebook and everyone's always talking about, you know, what's important to, you know, your offer conversion rates, the, you know, what's going to affect, you know, this headline structure, this video structure, everyone's kind of talking about that stuff. Nobody ever talks about, I mean, this is a little bit of a taboo topic, but I'll say it. Nobody ever talks about the biggest lever, okay? The biggest profit lever you can pull or not pull, right? And that is the level of aggression you have on your billing, right? It's actually two buckets, the level of aggression you have in your claims and then the level of aggression you have on your billing terms, right? Those. So like if you have, you know, the, the most egregious example is like the um, – the, the trial supplement sellers who use like those fake Shark Tank ads to sell like, look, our CBD was, you know, was advertised on Shark Tank. And, you know, uh, and they'll show that sort of pre-sell and then it'll go to like an advertorial and then it'll go to, you know, supposedly this free plus shipping supplement thing. But in reality, they start charging you like $200 a month and it's either buried in the fine print or sometimes you can't even find it and then you can't call them to get your money back like they don't respond like that would be like a a 10 on like the level of aggressiveness right but guess Mm -hmm. what it's really easy for those guys to make a lot of fucking money okay because like they're 
their return on ad spend is through the roof because their 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 conversion rates through the roof because they're charging you five bucks in theory, and then their their LTVs through the roof because they're just dinging the shit out of your card, right? That's intent. Then you've got like a like a a one or a zero would be just like a simple business that sells like a you know a simple straight sale product. There's no rebuilds. McDonald's. There's McDonald's. Yeah, thank you. Like there's no forced continuity there's no hidden terms like you know it's it's super simple so the to me the biggest uh lever anyone can pull it's like a push of a button is well if i'm operating at a two on my level of aggression right now like i have or a three i have an optional continuity program if they click this if they check this box they'll get 10 percent off today's order but now for their convenience we're going to ship them another product every month and automatically ding their card so if that brings us up to like a three or a 3.5 on the scale of aggressiveness right well the de- your decision as an entrepreneur to as to where to strategically set that dial that's going to have the biggest impact on your business by far both on profit and on risk so I, it's, it's, it's interesting to me how how few people discuss that, right? Mm-hmm. And the the trend that I've noticed, like in the time I've been, you know, in this world, the trend I've noticed is like a lot of guys, and I won't say names, but guys that are well known in the DR space, very well known, started off in their in their heyday, in their early days, with a more aggressive, much more, you know, started off at a seven. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We're starting off at a seven and a half or an eight. And then they made money. They built Mm -hmm. a war chest and they grew and they grew their company and they started getting a lot more eyeballs on what they were doing. So now they were like, all right, we got to play some fucking defense now. Let's tone down our claims, you know, in the claims bucket. Let's tone down our billing a little bit. Let's bring it down. Let's bring the heat down. There's more eyeballs. And they basically reinvested their ill-gotten gains um, and it, into solidifying the business. And now, and again, I won't say names, some very big companies, including some billion dollar companies, uh, you know, they've really built a moat around the business and, and kind of developed the right balance of like security, protection, defense, but just like a hair, just a hair of kind of pushing the envelope here and there on rebuilds, but they've protected themselves. And that's the trend. I've noticed, you know, in the time I've been in this space, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I mean, (laughs) self-preservation, you know, like, um, you know, it's scary. Listen, I'll tell you, man, this is something I had always, again, before I had like scaled up and, you know, made any real money, I had heard of, you know, guys say this to me who had crossed that threshold, you know, or had built a $50 million enterprise or a hundred million dollar enterprise prize. Is that like, when you, as, as it happens, it comes with fear. Like, like my first reaction to like, whatever, getting a $20 million size, um, whatever, two, two years, three years back, um, was like fear. I was like, it was mm-hmm. half excitement. Like, wow, this is crazy. A lot of money's coming in. But the other half was like, shit, yo, this is working, you know? And like, mm-hmm. I was like kind of nervous. So I think that, uh, self-preservation like the bigger you get the more eyeballs are on what you're doing even if you're doing everything compliantly everything cleanly like how many like great companies that did everything by the book still got taken down by the government or still got taken down by a litigious like lawsuit or something like that like Mm -hmm. the bigger you are the more vulnerable you are and so i think you have to reinvest into defense and get a trust and do all that stuff to protect your personal wealth and um you know that's the game man yeah, you know, your choice of words is interesting to me because I think that uh, self-preservation is one frame that is parallel to um, sustainability, to brand building, yeah. to um, stability, but all of those have different connotations. I can tell you for sure, though, that you know the when you talk about the aggression on your billing model and how aggressive you want to be with your billing model— um, the reason that it increases chargebacks as you do, you know, continuity programs or op, even if it's a voluntary opt in to this continuity. And you mentioned all the other little things you can do that make it uh, more aggressive, which is hiding the terms, which is adding extra things, et cetera, et cetera. Consumers don't like it. Mm. And so it results in chargebacks, right? A chargeback is 
uh, in its truest form, there are exceptions to this rule, but truest form, a representation that there's misalignment between what was promised, promised. by the business owner and what was being delivered by the business yeah. owner in the eyes of the consumer. Um, but you are, I think you are right that the trend is as you get to stability and as you get to a larger size, uh, it is very normal to see businesses correct course and change. In fact, uh, Netflix eliminated its trial offer. So Netflix grew the whole thing based on a 14 day trial. They said, Hey, try the product for free. Just enter your credit card info. And mm -hmm. I, I can't validate this stat, but I did talk to somebody that is very involved in uh, the chargeback space in a very high level. And he said that Netflix had a really high chargeback rate because of that trial offer. Cause they're doing wow. it at scale. Really? Right? But, but because they were so big, uh, they were kind of, uh, you know, too big to fail in essence. So they had a different set of rules to play by, but ultimately either somebody told them they had to, i.e. Visa, MasterCard or processor, um, or they just said, mm, not worth it. We've got too many chargebacks coming in from the trial offer. We're at a size where we're going to get rid of it. That's crazy that Netflix was eating a shitload of chargebacks, but yeah, the bank didn't want to lose that fucking business. Right. Right. Money talks. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Like, uh, uh, sure. I love it. Awesome. Well, we are all over the place. We covered a lot of fun stuff. Um, what, uh, you want to pitch anything? Where do you want to point people? If people want to find out about Julian Reyes, where do they go? I'm a ghost, man. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> nowhere to go. Actually, I looked at your, uh, I looked at your LinkedIn before we started and it says, do you know what it says? I don't. And I have to warn you, I made that LinkedIn like literally like 15 years ago and I never yeah. checked it again. I should probably update it. Uh, what does it say? It, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody go for the exact language and, and look you up on LinkedIn, but it says oh, something God. like, I think it is like 15 years ago and it says something like, uh, you'll never know. That's like the company that you work for. It's like owner of you'll never know. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. No, no. We, we, uh, we're, are, are, we have a real company. We actually have a, a conglomerate of, of companies that are managed by a, a Puerto Rico company now called Red Hot. And, um, you know, that's, no, we, we, I, I just listen. There's the guys out there that are, you know, the, the gurus and they're out there selling their service. I have nothing to sell, man. Like, I'm just, mm -hmm. we're, we're direct to consumer and that's kind of what we do. But it's, it's, you know, you're my boy, and it was super fun getting drunk with you at uh, in Cabo. And I just want to get out, get on here, and have an excuse to fucking hang out for an hour and a half. I love it, man. Tequila, big fan of tequila. We'll get your ass to Austin, and we'll uh, we'll do it again. I will, man. Thank you. Love it, homie. Thanks for the time. All right, thanks, bro. Love it. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I enjoyed doing it. I need your help. There are three places you can find Beyond a Million: the podcast itself, beyondamillion.com, which has some cool free resources, including a free course. And we finally launched the Beyond a Million YouTube channel. I would love it if you would go there and subscribe. And if you don't want to, you still would probably enjoy seeing the visual content. Check it out, youtube.com forward slash at Beyond a Million. If you learned one thing on this episode, share it with another entrepreneur. They need to hear it. Also subscribe so that new episodes just show up on your phone. It's a lot easier that way. And if you want the really good stuff, check out our free BAM Tactics and Strategies course. It's where we curate the best tips, tricks, and tools that our guests know, whether they've shared them on the podcast or not. Just go to beyondamill.com. You'll also find previous episodes and show notes at beyondamill.com.